Mr. Kok Heng Lu, you have two cuts of nine minutes. Can you take both together? First of all, I do declare my uh, interest as I have I run a theatre company in Singapore. Uh, I would like also to join my uh, fellow colleague, Mr. Lim, to actually repeat my request for a comprehensive report on the ACSR as we've just finished our first five-year cycle of funding for ACSR. I would also like to take this opportunity to offer some of my insights on the ACSR and some suggestions on how, to, how its scope can be widened. At the moment, the ACSR focuses on two key aspects. One, defining the Singaporean, Singaporean identity in a globalised world. Two, promoting social cohesion amongst all segments of the population. So what is the Singapore identity? If we ask people in the streets, their response might be our food or our language, Singlish, or our behaviour that we are Kinyasu, or even our love for shopping. Globally, the responses might be somewhat different. Some of us would have heard from overseas friends the Singapore culture is clean, safe, disciplined, not allowed to chew gum, uh, we cane people, and we have little freedom mm -hmm. of speech. But the Singapore identity goes much deeper than that, which I'm sure everyone here agrees. The late dramatist Kuo Pao Kun had imagined our cultures as a tree with deep roots. We are, first of all, a multiracial society where different races do not live in segregation. We practice different faiths, and it is not uncommon to see different places of worship line up next to each other. That is a unique symbol of our identity. We speak different languages and use different registers with one another, another often with ease. Our identity goes beyond food and shopping. It is encapsulated by our cultures, our memories, and our social connections. All this come together to form a collective body that we can identify with in an instinctive way. So when we talk about defining the Singapore identity in a globalised world, we should talk about our uniqueness that define us in a positive way. We should talk about our sense of belonging, our shared experiences and histories. We should talk about loyalty, our patriotism and our emotional connection to our country, our past and our future. Next year, we are celebrating Singapore Bicentennial. But what do we really know about our past? Or rather, what do we know beyond the surface, those stories of colonisations? Historically, Singapore has a deep and rich relationship within the Southeast Asian re region. It was part of the Sri Vijaya and the Majapahit uh, empires. Archaeological excavations in Singapore have confirmed that we were more than an insignificant mud flat or sleepy fishing village, as often painted by official narratives. Instead, we were a thriving settlement and port way back from the 14th century. History is not a single monolithic narrative. It is one composed of diverse players and their struggles. Some are victors, some losers. But everyone's story is equally valued because we learn lessons from history, lessons of courage, of defeat, of convictions, of quest to build better lives for communities beyond oneself. This story becomes part of the fabric of who we are collectively as Singaporeans. Stories about Singapore's colonization, our fight for independence, the struggle during the 50s and 60s, stories about communists and ex-communists, stories about so-called Marxist conspiracies, stories about men and women incarcerated, detained without trial. These are stories which should be part of our national conversation. Instead, they are often hidden and off ignored in the, national, in the national narrative. Why is the government so averse to these narratives and dissensus? Why are certain Singapore artworks, which offer alternative or counter-narrative, restricted from public screening or, or slapped with an RA rating, suitable only for those 18 and above? Why should Singaporeans, especially younger Singaporeans, be denied the multifaceted and complex history that made up our identity? Complexity matters because it shows how diverse we are and also how courageous we can be in confronting ourselves, our achievements and our errors alike. The diversity of our narratives needs to be validated with immediate effect. Our people today are a mature, discerning one. By providing access to disparate perspectives of history as opposed to any official account, we are not only acknowledging that Singaporeans can think critically, but also have a every right as a, sing, as a citizen of this nation to do so. When we silence or disregard certain narratives, are we then effectively saying our people are incapable of understanding complexities or that we don't trust them enough to do so? I would like to quote Mr. S. Rajaratnam, who, besides being a much respected politician, was also an established and published writer. He wrote in a radio play, which was performed in the 1960s. I quote, a national history and national consciousness begins when the history of every community is accepted as part of a common Malayan history, just as in Europe, the history of the groups 
tribes and states are, were molded into a common national history. It is not a question of falsifying history, but of re-examining historical facts in the light of the present. Therefore, search the buried past, the stones, monuments, chronicles, folklore, language, religion, bones, names, all the curled north seed roots sunk in the soil of history. Look at history from the standpoint of the Malayan man, from the viewpoint of the people on the threshold of Medeka, turning to look back at the long road they have travelled. Do this and you will see a new pattern, a meaningful pattern emerging out of the past. Unquote. Because of his appreciation and involvement in the arts, Mr Rajaratnam, I believe, was a more all-rounded, astute and humane politician. Which brings me to my next point, arts education. ACSR report has a significant focus on arts education in school as well as at a community level with the aim to bring the arts closer to the people and also to increase their knowledge of art. With active participation, people become more creative too. But is creative an end to itself? I urge our arts educator to go beyond that. We should aim for community and students to make creative interventions. Creative intervention is about putting creative thinking into solving problems, communal issues and social issues. Creative interventions mean that people become activists of their own lives. It means people become more po political. And I don't mean party politics. Rather, when people become conscientized, they become more aware of their rights, choices and decisions. They become better citizens. This would definitely benefit any ruling government because an active and informed citizenry can comprehend government policies and implementation better. Creative intervention steers us from viewing our world solely as a coldly pragmatic one, focused just on economic returns or efficiency. Instead, we begin to understand our interconnectedness, people to people, people to institutions, people to environment. Our values will then be influenced by the consideration of our shared space and based on mutual respect and dignity. After all, the second key ACSR focus is promoting social cohesion amongst all segments of the population. Is that why PA is keen to organize huge numbers of large events at their CCs? Social cohesion cannot come from just watching ad hoc ad arts events in communities and schools. It comes from engagement and dialogue, speaking and listening. We need to socially care before we can socially cohere. And I would like to end by talking about artists and their sustainability. It takes many years of support to hone an artist's craft. Even so, only a handful amongst artists will be able to gain international standings. Not every artist that gets a grant will be successful, but like any R&D, the cultural capital accumulated in the process will have a long-lasting impact. And it's just like what Mr. Simon Hu was going through 20 years before he got into another new innovation. Funding is limited, especially for smaller companies, individual artists and groups and artists that pushes boundaries, take risks, create experimental artwork. It is especially difficult for them to secure funding from private donors and corporate sponsors. How then can we support this artistic experimentation? One sustainable approach is to build the capacity of our bigger institutions like Esplanade, SSO, SEO, develop their fundraising team so that they can obtain more corporate sponsorship. Once this is achieved, the state can then divert more funding and play a similar role to that of a venture capitalist, providing support to these artists who are innovative and experimental and who need a leg up. Now, I also like to first thank our, all our colleagues who have been talking about the importance of arts and culture. So here I would like to end with a plea to all politicians. Please try to understand and engage with arts and culture more deeply. Look beyond the statistics, economics, policies, deliverables, and KPIs. Behind each of this is a human story. Your humanistic experience and profound participation in the arts will make you more aware of the people you serve and also of the artist's significance in society. There are thousands of full-time, part-time, and freelancers, arts educators, art students, artists in Singapore. Please come for our performances and exhibitions, literature festival, and buy Sing Lit. Experience the richness of our narratives. Could Stay member back to our post-production discussion. Make meaning, share your thoughts, and engage with us. Thank you.